us. We're fortunate enough to have a, a colleague from McGill with us this morning for our third talk, Dr. Uh, Mary Haig Ural, who is the director of the Ulster Library of the History of Medicine at McGill, an associate member of McGill's Department of Social Studies of Medicine Department. She studied medicine at Cambridge and Yale, medical history, I should say, at Cambridge and Yale, and has had a particular interest in the association between medicine and religion. And she's going to speak to us this morning about Maud Abbott from the perspective of the librarian. Um, thanks very much, Dr. Fraser. Um, and first, I did want to join the organizers um, in acknowledging that I live and work on lands of which indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe, are um, stewards. Um, so I proposed to talk today um, about Maud Abbott from, <laughs> from a librarian's perspective. Um, and you might be wondering, as I definitely have been uh, myself, what on earth does that even mean? I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Is a librarian's perspective really going to be any different from that of a scholar who spends hours becoming intimately acquainted with their subject by reading through folder after folder of personal and professional papers pulled from a gray box? Probably not. So what was I thinking? I don't really expect that I have a lot new to add on Maud Abbott. Um, as the person in charge of a library where Abbott is reasonably well represented, I've come to know that she appears in many places that are not publicly listed. So I think in some ways that's my implicit point, even if I maybe don't make it as clearly as I should, is that a librarian is gonna know about things or encounter things that you can't find in a catalog. Um, what I find interesting are the small details. There's the abbot who comes out in documents or correspondence where she's clearly identified as the author or recipient. There are also connections to archival font that don't necessarily hold material. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm clearly having a middle age moment here because I'm having trouble reading. Um, uh, and, and seeing the computer at the same time. Um, where she's clearly identified or where they're linked to her by provenance. And so, for instance, we have the George Drummond Fonds and the Wyatt Gallup Johnston collection that are connected to Abbott through curatorship. So both of these had been in Abbott's care at the Medical Museum before being transferred later to the Osler Library. So I sort of see them as not necessarily telling us anything about Abbott, and yet we know that she would have been aware of them. She would have seen them and if they're in her care, then I think she must have appreciated their value. So I'm not sure what that tells us, but I think it tells us something. And also one gets to know Abbott um, through correspondence with individuals where she's mentioned or discussed. And one of our audience members will certainly recognize the picture on the right um, as a personal sort of family um, connection to the Francis family, the Kellen family, who it came to us for, to eventually. Um, things like photos. Um, and also, I find her in inscriptions and books. So this is again where the librarian part comes in. Descriptive cataloging of books, of archives, of artifacts, does an amazing job at helping us find information that might otherwise be lost in the kilometers, yes, kilometers of shelving that we have at our disposal. Um, but cataloging is not intended to and never can capture everything. Moreover, there's some things that haven't yet been cataloged. Here we go, and I appreciate we have some Joan O'Malley pictures uh, written on one of those boxes. Um, and as a librarian then, when I take mental notes when I go through the stacks. I may be working on an entirely different topic, but I'll notice Maud Abbott, partly because so many people are interested in her, so many people ask us questions. So whenever I see something, I sort of note that it's there. Um, and this is an important part of discovery, and it supplements what our colleagues in cataloging can feasibly and responsibly do. So when going through the collection, there are a few often overlapping areas of interest that spoke um, to me. Um, you know, Abbott through her own records um, and materials, as well as reference files of previous librarians, Abbott's personal interactions, her professional ones, um, and when she's written about by others. 
In the end, what really struck me was how, by browsing the stacks and by scanning correspondence folders for information, one gets a sense of a person, but not always an intimate one. Here, we see on the left an inscription that's a testament to Abbott's intellectual ability, the 1892 Senior Dissectors Prize from Bishop's College. And then, a few decades later, in 1919, also relating to dissection, we have Francis Shepard inscribing a copy of his reminiscences of student days in dissecting room. I don't feel like I know Maud Abbott from things like this, but I do feel the respect of her peers, and sometimes their often entirely unselfconscious sexist disrespect, not in these particularly, but in other items. And despite what my title might imply, I don't really, I didn't set out to know Abbott but I did want to figure out where she can be found. So to find her, the first part of the call is going to be the archival collections that bear her name. So the Maud Elizabeth Abbott Font at the McGill University Archives, which are separate but complementary to the Maud Abbott Collection at the Ozer Library. The Abbott Font consists of notes um, from her time as a student, personal diaries, access to which is restricted pending review, drafts of an autobiography, and notes for research on things like the history of medicine, history of medicine Quebec specifically. And though I'm jumping ahead of myself in thinking of these diaries, which of course Anne-Marie has done so much on, when I'm looking at the correspondence and see other people talking about Abbott, I sort of wonder, you know, what is their take on events, like things like her accidents versus how she presents them in her diaries? The Maud Abbott collection, I should probably go back here, at the Ozer Library, as I mentioned, complements that in the archives. Um, there's family and personal correspondence or professional correspondence. We have photos, um, glass negatives. Um, we have, of course, you know, this is where showing things digitally is really misleading um, because the right-hand side actually has one of the giant panels from her 1932 um, exhibition or 31. Um, Whereas on the left are printing plates from her book. And you can imagine in person, the panel is several feet tall and a couple feet wide. Um, and the book plates are just a few inches by a few inches. And yet I've arranged them in such a way that makes the book plates look much bigger um, than the panels. Um, and then while Maud Abbott, the Maud Abbott font and collection form a, steer, a, a clear starting point for archival research, my librarian's perspective is also knowing, as I mentioned, that there's more. So at the Osler, one finds an, I think, unexpectedly rich, even though that very small, selection of material that was gathered by former honorary Osler librarian E. H. Bensley. He gathered information on a number of individuals, institutions, organizations that he thought were important to the history of medicine, and especially having a relationship to McGill. Um, and in that, he has five folders on Abbott, which is actually a lot. Most things have maybe one little folder. Um, so he thought that she was important. And I think this is another thing, is that when she appears, I think that's just another little sign that someone valued her, um, even if it's an inscription. Um, and they, you know, a lot of them are basic things that you find in sort of the librarian's you know, vertical file, like these articles. But we also have. Um, evidence that um, Howard Siegel and others were petitioning to get her on a stamp in the mid-1980s. And Bensley was supporting this effort. Um, so we don't have a lot of evidence of this elsewhere. Of course, it's not on the Abbott font because she wasn't alive at this point. Um, and so I sort of call this the hidden Bensley font as well because we have our own list of what all the files are, but it's not actually publicly accessible at the moment in our archival management database. And one also, I think, you know, getting back to where we find value in Abbott. Um, as a librarian, I'm drawn to book inscriptions. And again, because these are things that sometimes get into the catalog, but more often they don't. So here we see, um, you know, on the right, you can see the title page. This is for the tribute to Sir William Osler that, ed that, that Abbott edited. It's been specially bound for Emanuel Libman, who in turn appreciated Abbott in his inscription on the top left of her work, with my admiration and appreciation for your fine accomplishments. But then below that, we have a later note, the top one's 1927, the bottom one's 1940, 
from W.W. Francis, the first Ozer librarian, who says that, um, basically shares that, um, let's see if I actually wrote it out. This copy was specially bound for Emanuel Lidman of New York. Um, and inscribed by him to the editor, Dr. Maud Abbott, and they agreed that she should basically give it to the Ozer Library, as he reminded me yesterday at her funeral. So it's this complicated thing where she's had this book bound per Libman, who then inscribed it back to her, and then a couple of decades later, it was given over to the Ozer Library as they thought it was important. Um, you know, and then meanwhile, you have things like this inscription from Casey Wood. He inscribed her book to her, I think, because, you know, she's an important person in the McGill medical scene, but it's very perfunctory, and he calls her Miss, right? Um, but again, I think one of the things with these inscriptions is to remember that the presence of an inscription indicates that there might be something more in the relationship to examine. Or if someone's an historian, it might be a connection to investigate, even if there's nothing in the inscription itself. And so, for instance, with, with Wood, you know, he included Abbott and also Margaret Charlton, or I think it was actually another librarian at that point, in the circulation of this um, really horribly racist 1920 Christmas travel letter, <laughs> um, which he also sort of, he circulated to a small group of sort of local colleagues and said, please don't publish this for obvious reasons. We don't know what those reasons were. I doubt they had anything to do with his lack of self-consciousness about how racist it was. Um, and then in contrast, um, you have, um, we're coming back to Harold Siegel again. Um, these works don't actually, again, they don't sit, reveal much in the inscriptions themselves, but he collected a lot on Abbott. So we now come to realize that he owns a lot of things that she's written. He clearly values her. We know that he worked with her, but we know that from other information. But again, it's a thing where if you see that someone owns a lot of someone's works, maybe you can start investigating the connection. And of course, now we know from Bensley earlier that Siegel was involved in trying to get her on the stamp. Um, and I should say, it wasn't successful in the 80s, but she was on the stamp in 2000. Um, and then here, too, um, you have on the left, uh, Elmer Smith sort of saying, basically, to Maud Abbott, who inspired me to write this thing on Osler. And then on the right, you have to the Madonna of the Heart from the publisher. And so it's kind of impersonal, and then it says that it's from the publisher, and yet the, um, the epithet, Madonna of the Heart, has a sort of affection, I think, associated with it. So again, I think you get this building sense of her being valued and respected by her peers. Um, and I guess I'll... So, and I'll come to this after. Um, where I got really consumed, I think, or I'll, I'll leave this up actually because it relates to the last talk. So if someone wants to zoom in and see who the women were who went to Philadelphia, they're here. Um, but where I got really consumed actually was going through Abbott's correspondence with Osler. Um, and I wasn't expecting this and I really didn't want this to turn into a talk about Abbott and Osler. Lots of people have looked at it. Um, but it's, it's also partly because we have two decades roughly of, of letters that are professional and friendly. Um, and for the most part, he calls her doctor. You know, I started wondering, like, when I saw a few misses, like, could I, could I, like, maybe analyze this and figure out if when he was writing to her in a purely friendly way? But honestly, it's rare enough that at least my quick um, consideration of it thought there's maybe not a lot to it. Um, but, you know, it's also... Because we have so much of Osler, we can see how he writes about Maud Abbott also. So that's another aspect of it. It's not just how he writes to her, but how he writes about her. And also when he writes about her, she's usually Dr. Abbott, unless she's Maud Abbott. Um, but I did also want to mention her context. So here we have um, her going to Philadelphia with the other women. And again, I, because there's so much talk of the sexism, and, you know, in some of the letters, she's clearly missed and she's clearly demeaned. But, you know, in this coverage, there's none of that. These are all professional women who are being described that way. They're just medical professionals. Um, and I thought that that was an important thing to, to point out. Um, 
But meanwhile, <laughs> if we consider the McGill context, this is actually from a little bit earlier in the 20th century, it's just a snapshot from the medical bulletin, you can see that women within the institutional context essentially always had to defer to men. So she's listed here as the curator, but she has to report to Adami. And similarly, Charlton here is the assistant librarian. She's the only one who is qualified as a librarian, but she's not the librarian. The librarian is always a male doctor. And so, you know, and, and just thinking about this setup in the Osler correspondence, you often see him advocating. And, you know, and advocating for both Charlton and um, Abbott, actually, in terms of respecting their own professional expertise and what they were doing, but also sort of quietly working behind the scenes so that they had their own agency. Um, and so he's playing this role of mediator, um, and I don't expect anyone to read all these, but you know, it's really striking too the way that he essentially is treating her as just a colleague, right? It, it's as you would treat anyone else. And this shouldn't be surprising to us, but it is. And yet when you read, say, Adami's note on the left, um, you know, and he's talking about the catalog she was working on, and he's essentially insisting, A, that, that he should get some credit for it, but he uses such terminology. You know, he's saying that she vigorously and I think very stupidly resents his idea that he should be given credit. Um, he uses words like, um, he uses miss, of course. Stupidly resents storm in a teacup. Um, and yet, you know, in different years, you know, that's 1904. On the right, we have 1909, 1918. You see Osler sort of simultaneously playing mentor um, and also diplomat. Um, so like he writes on the top here, he's saying to, to Abbott that maybe he thinks he should be talking to Ad Adami about, about some of this material. Um, And then, you know, it sort of continues in, there's so much that's just appreciative and normal, or in, in again, the, the talk, the, the writings about Abbott, it's just another colleague who's doing good work, or in this case of Lady Osler writing about her as a, a, a loyal soul. Um, that is, I guess, one area where both she and Charlton are often referred to as things like saints. But then on the bottom, we have Francis to Wood, recounting one of these accidents um, and, you know, saying she was caught between two trams, she survived. She must have been made of rubber, not blubber. And, I mean, these sorts of words where you just think, you would never write that way about a man. And just a couple of years before that, I think to, to emphasize some of the struggles she had, Francis invited Abbott to the Osler dinner, um, the Osler banquet. And you know, on one hand, he's sort of bragging about how they are smashing, or she is smashing the anti-feminist gates by being the first woman to be there. And yet, at the same time, he's sort of joking that little girls should be seen and not heard, and talks about how maybe the newer generation have no issue, but some of the older members might not really like seeing her there. And I should say, it's still a few years before women were admit admitted into the Osler Society at McGill. Um, and so I think a lot of this isn't really about Abbott, um, but how her experience is, is a common one in women. You know, that sometimes you can just be a person. You can actually just be respected and admired for your actual accomplishments. Um, but that's, there's often this, this undercurrent. Um, and I think when I, when I was looking at the Osler correspondence, what strikes me is in some ways just how normal it is. And it's ironic that the normality of those interactions could be so poignant. Um, and he goes to bat for her too, um, and in a way that doesn't strike me as being paternalistic, in a way that you would go to bat for any other colleague when you know that you're in a position where you can make things better for them. Um, and, you know, between them, they wrote about personal things, they wrote about professional things. Um, as I said, I don't detect a lot of paternalism, even though there is some generally um, in the world. Um, and you know, they do things like they're inviting each other to 
to write, you know, I know you can't read this, but you know, on the right, she's saying, you know, I really think you're the best person to write the introduction to my catalog, which is true. You know, and elsewhere, he's appreciating her intellectual work. Um, so it, there really does seem to be a peer relationship going on. Um, or he has, you know, this PS, you know, is saying, you know, a suggestion in terms of making sure that the museum gets to hold on to the money that it's being given. Um, and I think we have this sense over time that um, this is someone that, um, you know, he's supporting someone in whom he has confidence and who also has confidence in him. And I think you can see this trust is well-placed. Osler didn't just afford her respect in direct communications. He did so in his writings to others, too, as I've mentioned. So here, for instance, he's encouraging Shepard to, to intervene. And we're getting back to this question of agency, right? Who has control of saying, you know, she really should be able to run the, the museum without interference. Um, and this last one, I think, is also just typical, which is why I chose it, of, of the correspondence between Abbott and Osler, and that it, can, it blends personal views, professional praise, and a professional request. There's almost always some like, can you send me that article? Can you send me that specimen? But also sharing personal news of their stories. And also, I think is this one also maybe have a, I'm not sure if this one also mentions the sister's illness. Um, And getting back to my bigger one that I suggested, that I think part of the relief that you have in Abbott, and I guess I say this because I've heard people speak about her adoration of Osler in a way that I think almost infantilizes her. <laughs> um, just in like, oh, she fawned over him sort of thing, the implication being. And I think maybe it's just that she, um, you know, when you face a daily assault, essentially, in Abbott's case of being an incredibly capable and intelligent, intelligent professional woman who nonetheless faced a lot of barriers, I think it's easy then to be in awe of someone who simply treats you decently um, or to really appreciate it to the point where maybe it looks like an adoration, but it's just such a relief. And I wouldn't underestimate that. Um, and I think it's important part of the, the bigger takeaways um, you know, the perspective of me as a librarian is, is partly what I'm interested in is how humanity comes through the sources. And it's not necessarily what you're gonna find in the archives, but if you're looking at how people interact, even if they're the small inscriptions, you get a sense of how people are as people. But in the correspondence, I think they also often reveal who they really are. <laughs> when you see how people write about people, they reveal a lot. Um, not always very good. Um, and, and also just to remind you, I think that the inscriptions, if I'm, if I'm going back to those, um, tell you a lot about networks and connections too. And so I would encourage people to look at them. Um, and I think I'm going to just abandon my notes there and not say any more, because I have no idea what time it is, but I'm gonna thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. That was terrific.